Hi folks, so in a prior video I shared details about building and programming capacitive soil moisture sensors. I got some great feedback in the comments of the video regarding challenges and considerations when using these sensors and ways in how I might improve my own design. On that note, I decided to do a little bit of a deeper dive on how I might use these sensors for predicting water availability for plants, especially as it relates to the soils present in my community. If you haven't watched my other videos, I live in Tucson, Arizona in the foothills of the Tucson Mountains. Pima County hosts some soil maps accessible via the web that suggest my community hosts a cobbly sandy loam soil type. Now, I'm not a soil scientist, but I wanted to double check that characterization and can see my soils contain significant amounts of clay based on samples collected along the main loop of my homeowners association. At the same time, they drain fairly quickly, suggesting a higher sand or loam component. Understanding my soil type is important for understanding plant water availability, since different soil types will hold on to water more tightly depending on their texture. In other words, as soils dry out, there may be some residual moisture that feels wet to the touch, but is inaccessible to plant roots given electrostatic forces holding that water in place. That point is known as the permanent wilting point. This is a challenge when using these sensors to guide irrigation since no guidance is given on how to take that plant wilting point into consideration. In this regards, I wondered if I might improve previously determined wet to dry ranges with a discrete flag that tells me when I've hit the recommended irrigation start point for my local soil. In fact, this chart has recommended irrigation start points as a function of soil texture and volumetric water content. So I wanted to see if I might calibrate these sensors to the minimum volumetric water content thresholds that should trigger irrigation. In response, I set up a simple experiment that would allow me to measure volumetric water content of a local soil sample using a PVC column of wetted soil and a digital scale to measure how much water has evaporated over time. Initially, the soil column is wetted. I can then insert a soil moisture sensor and record the wet reading. Conceptually, as the column evaporates, the change in weight over time should allow me to calculate the respective change in volumetric water content. While I'm doing this, I can take sensor readings to see if I can come up with a curve that correlates sensor response to volumetric water content or maybe even the specific sensor response to trigger irrigation at a threshold VWC. For this experiment to work, I'm gonna to need to measure a few soil characteristics to verify soil type and then set up a spreadsheet to capture my data and readings over time. Before I go on, I should make it clear that representative soil experiments are best conducted using soil core samples, which is definitely not the case in regard to my sample collection. Having said that, this is the best I can do with the equipment I have available, so I'll acknowledge this as a limitation right from the beginning. Let's start with my measurement of dry bulk density. This is simply the mass of soil that takes up a given volume of space. If the sample is a solid rock, the bulk density will typically be a little over 2.6 grams per centimeter cubed. But when I'm dealing with soils, the pore spaces will cause that density to diminish. So let's calculate bulk density for my soil sample. Accounting for the weight of my PVC soil column and dish, my sample weighs 1,269 grams. By taking length measurements of my soil column, I can approximate its total volume. Bulk density can then be calculated by dividing soil weight by dry soil volume, yielding a little over 1.55 grams per centimeter cubed. 1.55 grams per centimeter cubed is above published values for a silty clay, but I'm gonna stick with that texture for Ratcliffe's thresholds based on the observed soil texture and relatively good drainage of soils in my area. The reason for the difference may be that I simply have a greater clay component or maybe even some stones in my sample that might be driving bulk density a little higher than what's suggested in this table. Next, I'm going to want to calculate the volumetric water content of my soil at saturation. Volumetric water content is the volume of water divided by the volume of my wet soil column. 
In order to saturate my soil, I drilled 1 8 inch holes on the outside of my PVC column, placed it in a bucket, and added water. As the water level in the bucket rises, water will infiltrate into the soil column through the holes from the bottom, thus ensuring my entire column is saturated. Taking into account the weight of my soil, PVC column, and dish, I can then back out the mass of water added to the soil at saturation. Since one gram of water is the same as one cubic centimeter, that mass tells me how many cubic centimeters of water I've added to my column at saturation. It then just becomes a matter of dividing the volume of water by the volume of the wetted soil column, which yields a VWC of 44% at saturation. That 44% will be the starting point for my experiment. Of note, 44% saturation is above the 40% predicted VWC at field capacity for a silty clay, which makes sense for my predicted soil type. Next, I'll want to measure the porosity of my soil using this formula. At saturation, there is no volume of air to account for such that the formula collapses onto the one we just used to calculate volumetric water content. And thus, my porosity comes out to be exactly the same at 44%. I can now check published porosity values for different soil textures and witness that my calculated 44% is in the ballpark for soils that have a silty clay texture. In response, I'm going to work with the irrigation start point and wilting point thresholds for a silty clay, realizing respective flags at 30 and 20% volumetric water content. And here's the setup. I'll leave this in the sun to evaporate over the next few days while I randomly check for changes in mass, which will only happen as a function of evaporation, yielding deltas in my volumetric water content over time, which I can then also correlate to changes in sensor readings. Specifically, as the mass of the setup declines, I'll record the associated change as a loss of mass of water, and then record the change in volumetric water content over time. The key will be to monitor sensor response as volumetric water content goes down, with the goal of developing a sensor response curve that suggests when I might want to begin my irrigation or flag me when I've reached the wilting point for my given soil texture. Here's what the data looks like for my first experiment with the volumetric water content and sensor response rows color-coded in line with the thresholds on Ratcliffe's graphs. Before we get into the results, I'll do a deeper dive into the design of this table. On the left-hand side, I just need to record the total weight of my setup. My spreadsheet will then do the math to tell me how much water is in my soil column. On the right, my spreadsheet will calculate my VWC for a given measurement, and I will manually record the associated soil capacitance. My first record notes that the column is saturated at 44% volumetric water capacity with a capacitance of 440. Initially, I'll get some drainage until I reach field capacity, resulting in my volumetric water content going down, and then evaporation will kick in, further diminishing my VWC. And here's what that data looks like. I'll continue the experiment until I find myself under the irrigation start point with a volumetric water content of 27%. And as things continue to dry out, I'll eventually find myself under the permanent wilting point for my soil with a volumetric water content of 20%. As things continue to dry out, I'll drop to a VWC of 18% well below the permanent wilting point for the soil and at a level 60% lower than where I started. Now, if you've been paying attention to the sensor response, note that my sensor has been relatively insensitive to these soil moisture dynamics. This doesn't bode well for using the sensor exclusively to do any kind of formal irrigation management via reference to published tables and guidance for irrigation. At this point, I decided to do a quick check on the sensor and soil conditions. I observed that although my moisture content had dropped by 60%, the clays were doing a pretty good job of holding moisture in place as evidenced by soil sticking to my sensor. Again, this is being registered as wet conditions by my programming and my sensor, but that might be a false flag since that water is more likely to stick to the soil than readily be available to plant roots.
Here's the data graphed with irrigation and permanent wilting points plotted in yellow and red. Again, the fact that my sensor response is flat suggests that these sensors are not particularly sensitive to the specific conditions of my own soils, at least with respect to irrigation management. I ran this experiment a second time and got similar results, suggesting that without further refinement, these widely available capacitive soil moisture sensors are not good indicators of when to start irrigation or when you might be at permanent wilting point, at least for commercial crops planted in silty clays. Again, this is specific to my soils and the sensors might in fact respond to drier conditions, but by the time you hit those drier conditions, it might be too late. I should mention that I've tried this experiment in Tanks Green Stuff, which is a local provider of an organic planting bed soil, and I've gotten similar results where the soil is pretty much dried out, but it's still reading as wet or moist uh, using the sensor. So that's a red flag to me that, uh, that these sensors are challenged accordingly. So let's go ahead and summarize uh, what we did uh, with these experiments. Uh, specifically, my goal was to correlate capacitive soil moisture sensor response to published recommendations for triggering irrigation in soils within the Tucson Mountain foothills, which is where I live here in southeastern Arizona. Uh, what I observed is that a 60% reduction in volumetric water content for a saturated, silty clay yielded no significant variation in sensor response. So this suggests that the sensor wasn't particularly useful for determining an irrigation start point for native soils within my community. Having said all that, um, there are some considerations. Uh, the first is, I only tested this sensor on one soil type, specifically the kind of soils that I have in my backyard. So it may be that this sensor works in say, a sandy loam or some other soil type out there. I should also mention that Ratcliffe's graphs and thresholds are specific to commercial crops. So those thresholds may actually not be appropriate for native desert landscaping plants that are more tolerant of lower water conditions here in the desert southwest. So that's something that I need to do a little bit more research on. And finally, I need to consider coupling these sensors with other data uh, to maybe get better results. In other words, you know, maybe not just rely on the sensor, but also couple it uh, with visual cues in the landscape, or maybe couple it with another sensor, like a temperature sensor, and see if a combination of all those factors can give me um, better clues as to what's going on underground with respect to needs for irrigation. On that note, I'll be taking an even deeper dive into soil moisture monitoring by coupling these capacitive soil moisture sensors with DS18B20 temperature sensors, and installing these at various depths within a soil profile in my backyard. And the respective instrument has undergone a ton of quality control and refinement, and I'm just about ready to formally install this unit in my yard for future experiments. Down the road, uh, I am interested in seeing how I might uh, add sound to all the data that's being collected by the little data loggers incorporated in these environmental monitors similar to uh, what NASA does for listening to black holes. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if we could get a kind of a sonified indication of what's going on underground? So uh, I'm currently learning about MIDI and how to turn all this environmental data into sound. Uh, so that's something I'll be sharing uh, down the line. If you're interested in these experiments, um, please do consider subscribing. Appreciate uh, you watching and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.